How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends, and welcome to another evening, a nice, wonderful, comfortable evening in New York City here at the Manhattan Center, a night when the streets are busy, but we are in the house tonight, ready to hear the Word of God, and we're glad that you've chosen to sit down wherever you're joining us from, whether on the West Coast, East Coast, North, South, or overseas, we're glad that you're with us tonight for this important topic entitled, The Mark of the Beast. After tonight's topic, all the mysteries about what the mark of the beast is, is going to evaporate away, and you're going to understand what God's Word has to say about this vitally important end-time prophecy. Well, friends, join with me. I see you're excited to do so. Join with me as we welcome our speaker this evening, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Well, we have a lot of things to pray about tonight. First of all, we have a very important presentation, and I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad to see you that are watching. Well, I'd like to invite Mrs. Bachelor out. We'd like to cover as many Bible questions as possible in each presentation, and we know that some more came in. Well, good evening. Good evening. We're glad that you're here today. Are you ready for question number one? Let's try it. Please share the scripture text that says Jesus will not stand upon the earth when he returns. Now that goes back a few lessons when we talked about how Christ was coming and I told you that we are caught up to meet him in the air. Now is there a scripture that says we're caught up to meet him? Uh, you can go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says we will be caught up to meet him. The dead in Christ rise to meet him in the air. Uh, furthermore, Christ said, if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, he's in secret chambers, implying if he says he's anywhere on earth, believe it not. For when the Son of Man comes, this is Matthew 24, it will be like lightning shining from the east unto the west. And the context there is it's something above you that you cannot miss. But if somebody says, look, he's walking around somewhere, don't believe it, because when he comes, everybody's going to know, and it's going to be a heavenly event. The Bible tells us, you just use your reasoning powers, we are caught up to meet him when he comes, and then we're going back to those mansions. So uh, I, just by simple deduction, you can tell he's not walking around down here when he comes next time. We are going up to meet him. Amen. Well, maybe they're confused about when he, comes, when he comes back the third time. It does say in Zechariah 14, at the end of the 1,000 years, and this is what some people confuse, in that day his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. Well, that's at the end of the 1,000 years. That technically is what you might call the third coming where he comes at the end of the 1,000 years and the new Jerusalem comes down and the wicked are judged, and we studied that in an earlier program. Just last but night. when he comes next time, we're going up to meet him. He already came down once. He did his job here, right? Now he's bringing us to where he is. Okay. When will this great white throne judgment begin? At the conclusion of the 1,000 years, after the new Jerusalem settles, Revelation 20 tells us, that Satan is loose from his prison because now all the wicked are resurrected at the end of the 1,000 years. He then marshals them into a force and seeks in a desperate kamikaze attempt to take the city of God. Before they launch that attack, Christ will be glorified above the city where all can see. And the Father, all judgment is committed unto the Son, and we have a lesson coming on the phases of judgment also. We'll say more then. But at the end of the 1,000 years is when that judgment takes place, just before the devil launches his futile attack on the city of God, and the Lord then rains fire down out of heaven and devours the wicked. Okay. How long will the seven plagues in Revelation 15 and 16 last? Well, you know, the Bible doesn't give us a specific time. Uh, it says in Revelation, for in one day all the plagues come. 
Now, what does a day equal in prophecy? We've learned a day equals a year. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to take a year. Matter of fact, you look at the plagues and it's hard to imagine how life could last even a matter of, of months with the, the terrible um, situation that they're going to be with the water turning to blood, the oceans turning to blood, the earth being smitten with great heat. And so we have reason to believe that the plagues are going to take, um, it, when it says in a year, it means less than a year or in one year's time, it all wraps up. Now, in Daniel, well, I don't know if I ought to do this. In Daniel chapter 12, it talks about Michael standing up, time of trouble, a resurrection, and then there are three time periods that are given. The last two time periods are 1,290 days, and then it says, blessed is he that comes to the 1,335 days. The difference between those two is 45 days, okay? Then you jump to Revelation, in Revelation 18, where it talks about the plagues when Babylon the harlot is destroyed. Three times it says in Revelation chapter 18, in one hour, and one hour, and one hour, and it describes different aspects of Babylon falling. If a day equals a year in prophecy, and I believe it does, and if there are 360 days in the Jewish year, we, we have to use the Jewish reckoning, not the Roman reckoning that we use, 365 and one quarter, doesn't work biblically. 360 days to the Jewish year. One twenty-fourth of that is one hour. That would be 15 days. Are you with me? Three times one hour is three times 15. What's that equal? 45. 45. So you've got a 45-day period in Revelation dealing with the plagues, and you've got a 45-day period in Daniel that seems to talk about just before the second coming. How long do you think the plagues lasted that fell on Egypt? There's a pattern we can use. They all happened in a matter of a couple of months. You read the context. When the trials came on Job, how long did that take? All happened in a few weeks. And so I have reason to believe from the evidence in the Bible that the seven last plagues are going to happen quickly. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. Mm -hmm. So within a year, probably somewhere a couple of months, and the Bible is not specific, I ventured into Doug's opinions a little bit in answering that question. Okay. What is an example of dual prophecy? Dual prophecy. I talked about a dual application of prophecy in the Bible. Okay, the Bible tells us in, I think it's, uh, is it uh, 1 Chronicles 17, where Nathan the prophet comes to King David. David is thinking about building a temple. Nathan says, do all that's in your heart. Then as Nathan leaves, the Lord speaks to Nathan and says, no, 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 you're speaking on your own. Go back and tell David, you're not supposed to build the temple, but your son who comes after you, he will build me a house that will last forever. Okay, the son of David was going to build a temple. Now, what was the name of David's next immediate son that reigned? Solomon. Solomon, the wise king. He did build a temple for the Lord, the one that David was thinking of. But remember what Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I'll make one without hands. Christ is the son of David. He built a temple called the church. So here was a prophecy by God through Nathan the prophet of a temple that would be built by the son of David. It had two applications. Talked about David's literal son, Solomon, who did build a literal temple, but more specifically, it's speaking of Christ, the son of David, who built a temple that would last forever. So there's one example. There's many in the Bible. Tonight, we need to pray in a special sense again as we are going to venture into part two of our presentation on the beast and the mark of the beast. I invite you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. Loving Lord, right now we would ask that your spirit takes possession of all those who are participating in this seminar. We'd also pray, Lord, that your angels will evict and expel any demons or distractions that would come in to keep us from hearing what God is saying to our hearts. Help us to make the word exceedingly clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. have a little amazing fact for you. Dealing with the number seven. Are you aware that if you take six circles, I use quarters for this illustration, and you line them up in a circle, that the space that is left in the middle for the seventh will always equal exactly the diameter of the other six circles that are the same? You know, God designed that seven is the perfect number for a cycle. The honeycombs that the bees use for the hexagon is one of the strongest structures for, for building in the world, that hexagon form. What it is, in essence, is six of these shapes surrounding a seventh. 
the time dimension that God designed we live in is a blessed day that is encompassed by six working days. You know, something I think is unusual. You can take, for instance, where there's something in the sun, moon, and stars that gives us a 365-day year. All the ancient civilizations had a year with about 360 to 365 days. That's because that's how long it takes for the earth to make the circuit around the sun. Many of the ancient civilizations also had a month with approximately 28, 30 days because of the lunar cycle. That's where you get the word month, moon. All the world has a day with 24 hours because it takes 24 hours for the earth to rotate one time on its axis, right? But where do you get something in the sun, moon, or stars that gives us a seven-day week? The whole world, even atheist countries, have a seven-day week. The only place it can be traced to is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Seven is a cycle of time. It's the perfect number that God uses again and again in the Bible, and in particular in Revelation. Now, that will better help us understand what we're going to be studying here. Throughout Revelation, the number seven represents perfection or completeness. The number six represents imperfection. It was the basis for the Babylonian system of calculation. A triple six, therefore, symbolizes the triple union of error, the union of the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, or if you will, a counterfeit trinity. Let's go to our historical for tonight. We've heard a little bit about Cain and Abel. The study tonight is dealing with the mark of Cain. Now, friends, don't miss the significance of this. Right here in the beginning of the Bible, you've got two brothers making an offering. One kills the other. One has a mark. Then you find that same scenario in Revelation that revolves around the issue of worship. Adam and Eve initially had two sons. The first two humans born with a sinful propensity were Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve were not born with that, tense, that propensity. They grieved away the spirit, their, their spiritual dimension when they sinned. Then all of their posterity, all of their children were born like we are with these selfish desires. We must learn to love. Adam and Eve loved naturally. It doesn't come naturally for us. That's why the Lord has to command us to love him and to love our neighbor. We naturally first love ourselves. That's the problem with sin. So they had their first two sons, Cain and Abel. And even the earth back then, cursed by sin, was still very beautiful. Much more so than after the flood. God had designed the sacrificial system. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? They tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. God said, that will not do. And he sacrificed a lamb. He instituted the sacrificial system right there in the Garden of Eden. Revelation speaks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world when God incorporated the sacrificial system. They were told that this lamb, whenever they sacrificed a young lamb for their sins, it symbolized the day when God would come God the Son would come as the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And they'd bring their offerings to the gates of the Garden of Eden, and the Lord would bring fire down and receive and accept their sacrifice, indicating that they had been forgiven. Their worship was received and accepted. Well, the Bible tells us that Cain and Abel were about as different as Jacob and Esau. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain, on the other hand, was a tiller of the ground. And when the time came for them to bring an offering as they matured and they did it on their own, Abel did it according to God's design, the specifics that God had given. He laid his hands on the head of this innocent little lamb. He killed it. Its blood was sprinkled on the altar, and then he laid it on the altar, and fire came from God and accepted the sacrifice. You remember when Moses inaugurated the tabernacle in the wilderness? They did not kindle the fire. Fire came from God showing that he had accepted their worship and their sacrifice. When Solomon inaugurated the temple that he built in Jerusalem, after he prayed, fire came down from God to show that he had accepted their sacrifice. On Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal, false worship, false god, no fire. Fire of God came down for Elijah to show he accepted his worship and his sacrifice. Cain said, I don't want to do it the way God prescribes. It's messy, and as long as you give something... Abel, he's a keeper of sheep. I'm a farmer. I'm going to bring of my own works. I've worked hard for these fruits. And he brought an offering of his works. No fire. Cain was insulted. He became very angry at his brother. And I believe that Abel tried to appeal to him. 
Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and finally he rose up against his brother Abel and he slew him, probably bludgeoned him to death. He killed his brother. Because of Abel's badness or because of his goodness? Why was Jesus persecuted? Because of his badness or because his goodness made the false teachings of the religious leaders infuriated? That same spirit will be seen again in the last days. And then a curse was placed upon Cain. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He was actually mocking the occupation of Abel, who was a shepherd. I'm not his shepherd. I'm not his keeper. Isn't it strange that uh, God asks questions and we think we can lie to God, like Jonah running from God? God knows all things. Amen. He wanted him to think, where is your brother? It was his younger brother. He should have cared for him. And God said, the voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any, any finding him should kill him. Now, we're not exactly sure what that mark is. It doesn't mean the Lord ran down and put a big rubber stamp on Cain's forehead, said, do not disturb or do not kill. But God did something to distinguish him. There was an aura, something about him that was different. You know, uh, you've heard of Charles Manson, who, of course, was guilty of those heinous Sharon Tate murders. He's got all of these diabolical tattoos on his body. And even though he's a scrawny, skinny fella, none of the other prisoners fool with him because they believe that he has a, an aura of protection from the devil. No one in prison wants to touch him because they're afraid. They think he's in league with the devil, and he probably is. Well, the Lord did something. We don't know what happened, but no one else ever murdered Cain. Cain died of old age. But notice what happened here. Cain's offering was not accepted. And he killed his brother. Two forms of worship, true and false. One according to God's commands. One was man-made worship. Now, you know, Revelation tells us that one of the great deceptions the devil will perform in the last days that is so convincing, if possible, it might deceive even the very elect, he brings fire down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. All these times I've cited in the Bible, when the fire came down, it was evidence that God approved of and accepted and received their worship, their sacrifice. The counterfeit system of, of worship is going to manufacture a counterfeit acceptance of God. False fire coming down to show that God approves of their worship. It's going to look like God approves. It's going to look like God's Spirit is with them. But it's not going to be according to the Bible. Our only safety in the last days, friends, is we need to know what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Question number one in our lesson. Who will be protected through the seven last plagues? Answer, Revelation 3, verse 7. The Scriptures say, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, wait a second, Doug. I thought the people marked in Revelation were all lost. Surprise, surprise. Everybody in Revelation gets marked before the Lord comes back. We don't like to think about the seal of God as being a mark, but, you know, really, it uses the same language for both. Everybody's going to have either the seal of God in their forehead or the mark of the beast in their hand or their forehead. But everybody is marked. That ought to tell you something, whether or not it's a literal mark or something more than that. A lot of the Christian world has been bamboozled into thinking the devil's going to line everybody up with this big rubber stamp and go, put 666 on everybody's forehead. And then people say, I'm not getting the mark of the beast because as soon as someone comes after me with a rubber stamp, I'm running. And they might run right into the arms of the beast because the devil, he's a shrewd operator and he's fooling most of the world. The Bible says in Revelation, who deceiveth the whole world. Don't underestimate his deception. Number two, what is this seal that the righteous have? Now, before we talk about the mark of the beast, let's talk about the mark of the seal that God's children get. How many want that mark? How many want that seal? How many of you want to be spirit-possessed? On Halloween, you don't raise your hands for that question, do you? <laughs> it depends on what spirit, right? Yes. But you know why you were so hesitant? Is because when I say spirit possessed, we instantly think of what? The devil possessing people. But the Bible says that an excellent spirit was in Daniel. You and I can be spirit possessed with the Holy Spirit, and we must be, amen? We must be baptized in the water and in the spirit. We want to be not only spirit filled by God's spirit, we want to be sealed with God's seal. 
in our foreheads. What is the seal? Tells you right in the Bible. The keys are in the Old Testament. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So the seal of God is in the law of God. Now, what is a seal? Let's find out more about that. You've probably seen the number of seals through your life. Most seals com contain at least three characteristics. This is a, a Canadian seal. And sometimes you'll see the president gives a speech on the podium. They've got the presidential seal. A seal will contain the name of the official, the title of the official, and his or her territory. Okay? When uh, President Clinton makes a speech, uh, the seal will say uh, William Jefferson Clinton, that's his name, president, his office, United States of America, his territory. Okay? There's a number of seals you can find in the Bible. When Pontius Pilate stamped the seal on the tomb of Christ. Remember, they rolled a stone and sealed it. It said Pontius Pilate in the wax. Pontius Pilate, governor, Judea. That was his title, his territory, his name. When Darius the king put a seal on the stone that sealed Daniel in the lion's den, it said Darius, king, Medo-Persia. Those three characteristics are found in all seals. What, which of the Ten Commandments contains all the elements that you find in a seal? Answer? In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord, that's his name, made, created, that means his, that's his title, the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. In the middle of God's law, the one commandment that begins with the word remember, it's, in, it's very interesting to me, it's the only commandment that people are saying we should forget. The longest of the Ten Commandments You've got the seal of God in his law. Now, let me explain something for you, and uh, I hope you already know this. The mark of the beast principally is the spirit of the devil. Everybody who has the mark of the beast has the spirit of the devil. Everybody who has the seal of God is sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? So we know that the internal seal of God is the Holy Spirit. But there's something beyond that, and that's what we're learning about now. Now, in the Sabbath commandment, we've got the seal. The Lord thy God, his name, creator, his office, heaven, earth, that covers everything, his territory. And that's why the devil especially hates this commandment because every Sabbath day it points to God as our creator. The devil cannot create life. He cannot resurrect. He cannot heal. All he can do is deceive and create illusions. He does not have creative power. He cannot procreate. He especially hates humans because we, through an act of love, procreate in our own image when we have families. The devil can't do that. Angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. So the devil hates humans because we, like God, procreate in our own image. The devil hates the Sabbath because it's a memorial that God is creator. <laughs> Question number four. What has God given as a special sign of his power? What does the Bible say? All right, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Exodus 20, 20. I'm sorry, Ezekiel 20, 20. Hallow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Exodus 31, 13. Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Now, the phrase sign in the Bible that you find here is synonymous with the word token, mark, seal, other places in the Scripture. It means the same thing. The Sabbath is a seal, it's a sign, it's a token, it's a mark that we belong to God, that we're His property. How many of you, when you come to the Lord, recognize you need a new heart created in you? Psalms 51, create a new heart in me. The Sabbath is a sign that God has that creative power in His Word to give you a new heart. How many of you want to be sanctified? The Bible tells us the Sabbath is a sign that he sanctifies us. All these things that are intertwined with redemption, the Sabbath commemorates his creative and his recreative power. That's why this is a very important issue. People underestimate the significance of these things. Question number five. What does the second beast of Revelation 13 force all to receive? Now, we've talked about the seal of God. The seal of God is found in his law. And in, in his law, it's the Sabbath commandment, and it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that rest that it uh, represents. Now, the beast has a mark. 
we found out what the beast is. First beast in Revelation 13, it's Rome and then the Roman Catholic Church. The second beast in Revelation 13, verse 11, is the United States and Protestantism. And so, do not be offended. These prophecies are explaining these things. And I want to reiterate, I'm not talking about people. There are lovely people in all different denominations and persuasions. I went to Russia. I love the Russian people. Uh, Karen and I worked there six weeks, did a series of meetings similar to this, and they were so gracious, lovely people there. I hate the Russian government. The organization is the most corrupt, disorganized thing you've ever seen. And I don't think there are too many Russian people I know that will disagree with me. You can dislike an organization in a company and still like the employees or the constituents. Do you see what I'm saying? I personally, I've tried not to sound like I'm bragging, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Some of you may have already figured that out. We've got some really nice people in my church, and we've got our share of fruitcakes too, <laughs> just like everybody else. So, you know, there are good and bad people in every persuasion. So what we're talking about in this study is, what does the Bible teach? What is the truth of God's Word? You see, friends, just before Jesus comes back, it's very clear there is going to be a shaking among the religious world and people are going to polarize into one of two groups. Seal of God, mark of the beast. Worship the beast in his image, go by the law of God and worship the Almighty. There's going to be two groups when he comes back. Only two roads. Right now there are people sitting on the fence in many different persuasions. There are going to be people that leave my church, I'll tell you right now. And there are going to be people in all different persuasions that take a stand on the truth. And so we're talking about the truth of God's Word. And whenever you do that, you take a risk that some people will be offended. Friends, if I say something that offends you, please know it's not my intention to do anything to unnecessarily grieve you. But I need to be faithful to tell you what the Bible says, okay? And so you pray for me. Uh, I want to tell it straight. Revelation 13, 16 is our answer. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now we're going to get right to it without fooling around. What is the mark of the beast? Now this is in your lesson. It's not an answer you fill out, but it's several quotes. This is from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Uh, this is an older version by Reverend Peter Geinerman. I hope I said that right. Catholic Catechism, when I went to Catholic school, if you want to be a good Catholic, you go through their catechism. It's in question-answer form, which is a good way to teach. We're using it here with the lessons. We answer questions. It, it's the Socratic method. It helps you think. God uses the question-answer method to teach. It's an excellent method. Question, which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, this is from their catechism, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday? Good question, instead of Saturday, if Saturday is the Sabbath day. Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. They freely admit that. Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? In other words, they're saying, what, what proof do you have that the church can make different holy days that aren't found in the Bible? Answer, had she not such power, notice it says she, not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. Not all. I respectfully disagree. Most, yes. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. They are absolutely correct. There is no scriptural authority. And not only do they admit it, but most Protestants admit it as well. Let me read some things to you. I didn't have enough room in our lessons to give you all of this information, but uh, I'll give you a little more of it here. These are some quotes that you can find um, a variety of places. There's several books out that are in bookstores that have these things. Statements by various church leaders regarding the Sabbath problem, that there is no biblical support for Sunday. Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, the author of the Baptist Manual, Baptist minister, listen to what he says. There was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will, however, be readily said and with some show of triumph that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I've studied for many years, I ask where the record of such a transaction can be found. 
Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence for the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. You know, you show this to Baptists, and very few of them will admit, you know, that is true, we do know that, because they try and say, no, there's a scripture somewhere, I've got to find it, give me some time, I'll get back to you. And this is the approach that a lot of Sunday keepers take. And I remember when I first learned this, friends, I used to go to church on Sunday. I was defensive, I was upset, I was shocked, but finally I had to decide, do I want to go by the Bible or do I want to follow popular religious trends and traditions? When I decided to go by the Bible, it became very clear to me there is no scripture anywhere that commands us to keep the first day holy. There's no question about which day is the first day. It's what we call Easter Sunday, the Christ, the day Christ rose. No question about which day is the seventh day. You look in the encyclopedia, in the dictionary. Jesus did not change one of the Ten Commandments. Protestant Episcopal. This is an explanation from their catechism. The day is now changed from the seventh to the first day. But as we meet with no scriptural direction for the change, we might conclude it was done by the authority of the church. They admit the church did it. The question is, we're a church. I mean, we get together, church is people. Can we right now vote to change one of the commandments of God? No. no. Uh, Paul said that even if an angel from heaven teaches something other than what the gospel is, let him be accursed. To tamper with the law of God is a very dangerous thing. Amen. From a Baptist periodical called The Watchman, the scriptures nowhere call for the first day of the week as the Sabbath. There is no scriptural authority for doing so, nor, of course, any scriptural obligation. Presbyterian. This is Canon Eaton in the Ten Commandments. There is no word nor hint in the New Testament about abstaining from work on Sunday. The observance of Ash Wednesday or Lent stands exactly on the same footing as the observance of Sunday. In the rest of Sunday, no divine law enters in. There's no scripture for this. And these theologians that are well acquainted with the Bible, they admit it. They say, if we want to be honest, we're following a tradition. I think it's dangerous to follow a tradition. I don't have time to read this, but I've got quotes here from the Episcopals and from the Lutherans and from the Methodists, and here's one from Methodists. It is true there is no positive command for infant baptism, nor is there for keeping holy the first day of the week. Many believe Christ changed the Sabbath. But from his own words, we see he came for no such purpose. Those who believe Jesus changed the Sabbath base it only on supposition. There's no scripture for that. It's all based on supposition, as the writer there concludes. You have your Bibles. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. I'm just going to kind of uh, get back on my hind legs and preach to you for a minute here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Christ is speaking. Page 1402 in the Seminar of Bibles. Think not, that means do not think, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but fulfill. Some people think fulfill means to do away with. Have you heard that before? Christ came to fulfill the law, and that means do away with. Have you heard that before? Yes. You remember when Jesus came to John the Baptist in Matthew, same book, to get baptized. John the Baptist said, I need to be baptized by you. What are you coming to me for? Jesus said, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to... Fulfill all righteousness. Now, does that mean do away with all righteousness? Wouldn't it seem peculiar if the word fulfill meant to abolish or do away with, to use it like that here? Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to destroy. <laughs> that wouldn't make any sense, would it? He's not saying fulfill means to fill full. He came to keep. That's what it means. I've not come to abolish, but to show you how to keep it. That's what he's telling us. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle will in any wise pass from the law. Is the earth still here? The heaven's still there? The law's still there too, friends. It hasn't passed away, Christ said. Whoever therefore shall think to break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And I know some people that think, well, yeah, at least I'll be in the kingdom of heaven. I'll be called least, but I'll be there. They're not understanding the scripture. What Jesus is saying is the people in the kingdom will call that person the lowest individual. They're not there. They are referred to in the lowest form. Those that break even the least of the commandments and teach others to do so, that ought to make some religious leaders out there shudder a little bit who are teaching people that you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments. God have mercy on me if I should ever stand before 
humans and tell them, you don't need to keep God's law. Sin is the transgression of the law. For ministers to tell people it's okay to sin is a hideous doctrine of devils, friends. I'm just telling you straight. Because the law shows us our sin and brings us to Jesus. We need the law not to save us, but to show us we need Christ. And that means even the least of these commandments, right? So if you have issue with me talking about the Sabbath, and I always get a lot of letters, you're spending so much time in this one commandment. Doug, why don't you go on and talk about something else? What do you want me to do? If I'm living in a society where Christians are saying it's okay to break one of the commandments, I'll talk about any of the ten. And right now, the most prominent one that's being neglected by Christians, Protestants, and Catholics is God's Sabbath day. Now, why is this important? We have learned from the Bible that the first four commandments deal with our relationship to God. The devil has already shown his hand how he operates. There in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, king makes a graven image and he commands Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to break the second commandment about idolatry or be thrown in the furnace. They decide to obey the law of God instead of the law of man and the government. They are persecuted, they go to the fiery furnace, but the Lord delivers them. So then the devil, by the time he gets to Daniel 6, he says, well, let's try this again. He makes a political law that all the people have to worship the king. That breaks the first commandment. Daniel says, I'd rather go to the lion's den, but I'm going to open my windows and let people know I pray to the Almighty. Yes. Now, here we are at the end of time. The Bible says in the book of James chapter 2 that whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of all. I mean, if you, you know, sin is sin, right? Yes. And whether it's... Uh, adultery or Sabbath breaking, you might think, well, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin as far as God is concerned. Sabbath breaking is like coveting. It's a sin. And so the devil, very clever, he is a shrewd operator. In the last days, he says, I've got it. I've got it now. For my masterpiece, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm going to make a political, religious law, and I'm going to say, go to church. Keep the Sabbath. But don't do it on the day that God specified and set aside and sanctified and blessed We'll just pick a different day because God is in particular. Oh, how subtle he takes the last of the commandments that begins with God. How subtle and insidious can he be? Can you see what he's up to, friends? Why this one commandment is a big issue? Yes. Because it's going to be the pivotal point in the last days. Who you worship, the Sabbath is the one commandment that deals with this. Where am I now? Number seven. Is either the mark of the beast or the seal of God visible? A lot of people think that the... Uh, Mark of the Beast is this, you know, branding on the forehead. And then for a while there, everybody thought the barcode was the Mark of the Beast. How many of you remember when the barcodes first began to appear? I know some people back then, they said, that's the Mark of the Beast. Don't buy any products that have the barcode. <laughs> now, those people all starved to death a long time ago. <laughs> and then, you know, they're, they're coming out with these movies now that talk about um, well, suddenly you disappear left behind and what's going to go on during the seven years of tribulation. And they always portray the mark of the beast as an external physical mark. The devil wants people to think that because it's the furthest thing from the truth. He's setting the stage for a masterpiece of deception. The Bible tells us what the mark is. It says in Hebrews 10, 16, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them in their minds. The seal of God is in the heart and the mind. Furthermore, Hebrews, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Your hand is speaking of your doing, your works, right? And it shall be, Exodus 13, 9, it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law, his what? His law might be in your mouth. You know, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12. And so if we've got the Lord's law in our heart, it comes out of the mouth. So it's speaking about in your mind and in your heart, and then it comes out in the actions. Now, get your Bibles with me. Turn quickly to page 300. Page 300, that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to be going to verse 8. You all remember this great passage in verse 6 where it says, all right, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, The Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Now, Deuteronomy 5, just turn back one page and you glance quickly. You've got the Ten Commandments there. Verse 8, Thou shalt not make any graven image. Verse 9, Don't bow down to them. So forth. Keep in mind, there were no chapters and verses. 
Now, right after he gives the Ten Commandments again in chapter 5, in chapter 6, Moses said, verse 8, and these words, no, I'm sorry, verse 6, and these words that I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them to your children diligently. You'll talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lay down, and when you rise up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign, a seal, a token, upon thine hand. They shall be frontlets between thine eyes. Now, in Hebrew, between thine eyes was the forehead. In Greek, in the New Testament, they call it the forehead. The Old Testament, they always said between the eyes. It's the same thing. That's where Goliath was brought down, right there, between the eyes, okay? Go with me to uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Therefore you shall lay up these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign on your hand. They may be frontlets between your eyes. Four places, no less. In the Old Testament, it speaks about the law and the word of God being in the head and being in the hand. Now what's the significance of that? Is that saying in the last days that all of God's people are going to have a tattoo in their head or their hand? No. He's telling us the works, it says their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. It's speaking of works in the hand. Another scripture, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction is in their path. So in the head and in the hand symbolizes in your deeds and in your thoughts. You worship with your mind, you do with your hand, biblically. Your foot represents the direction of your life. You know how beautiful on the mountain are the feet. These things had significance in the Bible, okay? So, God's seal and God's law in the forehead represents an affection, a devotion to the truth of God. That's why he said, I repeat in Hebrews 8.10, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. This is the new covenant, friends. This is how you separate those who worship the beast from those who worship the Lord. They've got the law of God and the love of God in their hearts. Amen? Amen. Number eight, how does Jesus determine if we are his servants? Romans 6.16, know ye not that whoever ye... Oh, hang on here a second. I'm fumbling with my lesson. Who designed these things anyway? I did. Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. John 14.15, If you love me, keep my commands. He didn't say just talk about them. He says, if you love me, keep them. Why would Jesus do away with them and then tell us that? Number nine, does anyone have the mark of the beast now? No. Revelation tells us when it's going to be a pressed issue. Revelation 13, 17, when it comes to the place that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, maybe you saw this edition of Time magazine speaking of the future of money. We're going faster and faster to a cashless society. How many of you have one of these... Uh, You get everyone's attention when you open your wallet. Boy, I tell you, this is the closest attention I've had all night long. You've got one of these ATM cards, you know. This is actually an ATM card. They're now combining my ATM card with my credit card. Now, I want you to know these are dangerous things. Not because they're the mark of the beast, but because Americans have too many and they're in debt. Karen and I pay ours off as soon as we get it. The only reason we've got a credit card is I can't even get a hotel or a rental car without one these days. Now they're developing something called a super card that will have not only your driving record on it, it'll have your picture. You will pick your bank and credit card services, your phone services. You will punch into work by sliding the magnetic strip in at the office, your medical health information. They're developing a super card. It'll be a little bigger than this, and you would be astounded how much information they're going to put on that little bitty strip there. And if you do not cooperate with the religious political laws that go along, you know, uh, you're going to go to the market. I don't know what it's like here in New York City. I'm in California. People all buy their groceries. They slide their card through when they get to the checkout stand. They buy their gas. I never just pay cash. I use my card whenever I buy gas. It's wonderful. It helps you keep the records and everything. Someday there's going to be a law that we must worship the way the government says. And if you do not cooperate and you don't check in at the right church at the right time, you're going to go to buy your groceries, it'll say, invalid transaction. Now, not only is this a tool that will be used. Incidentally, there's no evil in the cards. They're a tool that will be used. 
The beast is probably also going to use automobiles in their service. That doesn't mean cars are evil. You understand what I'm saying? It's a tool. No checks, no fuss, no cash. Despite glitches and issues of privacy, more Americans are turning to cards and computers to pay their bills. They cannot buy or sell unless they cooperate with the beast's power. Now, Revelation is not principally dealing with interpersonal relationships. It's dealing with kingdoms and, and politics and religions. Isn't that right? Yes. Cannot buy or sell. You know, right now, the United States, in keeping with the United Nations, is affecting, in a number of places in the world, what they call economic sanctions. They are limiting or controlling or forbidding other countries to buy and sell with some of these renegade maverick nations that are practicing terrorism or that are inhumane or some of the other scandals that they're guilty of, of military aggression like Iraq and Cuba. Economic sanctions will not allow them to buy or sell. And this is the way and the wave of the New World Order. Number 10, what two things does the Antichrist power attempt to change? Now let's talk about the Antichrist for a second here. Somebody just gave me this this week. I thought it was interesting. Can we recognize the Antichrist? Yes, new book out that helps us see that Prince Charles is the Antichrist. <laughs> Everybody's wondering, who's the Antichrist? If he's the Antichrist, then I'm a rocket scientist. <laughs> How many times does the word Antichrist appear in the book of Revelation? Zero. It's not in the book of Revelation. It's in 1st and 2nd John. And John tells us that there were even many Antichrists back in his day. The characteristics of the Antichrist help us know who he is. It tells us in our answer, he shall think to change times and laws. Daniel 7 is clearly speaking of the Antichrist. There's only one of the Ten Commandments that is both a time and a law. You know which one it is? It's the Sabbath day, the Sabbath commandment, the one in the middle of his law. Now notice this from the Catholic's own writing. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's a scary statement. Of course the Catholic Church, this is from their, letter, their letters, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, notice this, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power, um, an act is a what? A mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. That's something that ought to give you the heebie-jeebies. Yes. Notice, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any direction noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's 1995, St. Catherine's Catholic Church, Sentinel. Need to send them a letter of uh, gratitude for the endorsement. <laughs> What was it that Peter told us should be our creed? Peter said to the religious leaders who told him to stop preaching the truth, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. We should not be following church creeds and traditions of men. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for commandments the doctrines of men, man-made commandments. We've got to decide who do we serve, the Lord, follow his word, or man. Not only are there changes in times and laws, but the uh, Catholic Church has made some very bold changes. U.S. News, 1996, Vatican thinking evolves. The Pope gives his blessing to natural selection through man's soul remains beyond science's reach. In other words, man still has an immortal soul, but he says that evolution is still a good option. Did God create mankind in his image, as the Bible says? Or did humans evolve from animals as Darwin theorized 150 years ago? According to Pope John Paul II, evolution may be a better explanation. You know, friends, I've got my own little theory here that if God's church had kept the Sabbath day the way he designed, there would be no evolutionists because every Sabbath day we're remembering that we are created. We did not evolve from apes and monkeys and alligators from the Catholic Encyclopedia, we should not interpret Genesis literally. Well, they thought to change times and laws and to make major changes in the Word of God. Now, question number 11. 
What was God's criticism of his ancient priests and pastors? Things have not changed much. What does the Lord say in Malachi 2, verse 8 and 9? You've caused many to stumble at the law. You have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Now, someone says, well, as long as you keep most of them, that's all that matters. And, you know, a lot of churches, I, they'll learn the Sabbath truth, and they'll say, you know, my church preaches the Ten Commandments. We, we don't talk much about the Sabbath, but we preach the rest of them. Or we do preach the Sabbath, but it, we've changed it a little. We go along with Sunday, and you know what that's called? Being partial. This is not a new mistake, because the devil knows if you break one, you're guilty of all. Can you imagine a person standing before the judge and saying, Your Honor, I realize that I'm guilty of murder, but I keep all the other nine commandments, and that ought to stand for something you should let me go. Is the judge going to go for that? No, but I don't commit adultery. I don't lie. I don't covet. I'm, I'm good in every other respect. I just, I have this little problem. I killed somebody. <laughs> just a, one, one out of nine, I'm doing 90%. That ought to stand for something, right? You think God's going to go for that argument? Some people think the Lord weighs salvation based on that. He wants to know if we really love him. You know how you prove you love someone? You give them your time. That's how you worship, with your time. The Sabbath is made to worship God in the dimension of time. And so when people say, Lord, Lord, and they don't keep his commandments, the Bible says, he'll declare, I don't know you. Ye who work iniquity, and that word iniquity is lawlessness. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I'll also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest unto me. Seeing then thou hast forgotten the law of my God, I will forget thy children. Because they've rejected knowledge. And then he specifies they've forgotten the law of God. I don't know how much more specific God can be. Number 12, how did God's ancient leaders regard the great things of his law? You can find this here right in the Bible, Hosea 8, 12. I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. You know, I present the Sabbath truth to some people and they look so bewildered and so perplexed. The Sabbath day? You mean he really expects us to keep it on the seventh day? What difference does it make? And I know some people say, as long as it's one in seven, it doesn't matter what day is your Sabbath day. As long, have you heard that argument before? Yes. I've never heard a pastor stand up in his church Sunday and say, as long as you show up here one day in seven, we don't care what day it is. You all want to come Thursday? That's fine with me. They never go for that argument until they find out it's the seventh day. Yes. It's amazing. People then say, well, we know, you know, you can't be sure which day is the seventh day anymore. Well, that means you can't be sure which day is the first either, right? <laughs> they have no problem with these issues until they learn the Sabbath truth. Number 13, what specific solemn rebuke did God give to religious leaders regarding his holy Sabbath day? Ezekiel 22, verse 8, thou hast despised mine holy things and has profaned my Sabbaths. You know, there's only a few things that the Lord has called holy. Ezekiel 22, 26, her priests have violated my laws and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. Oh, friends, I've seen it so much, and it breaks my heart. You know, the evidence is so powerful. It's so overwhelming. I told you that when I first learned the Sabbath truth, I did not want to believe it because I was already different enough. I did not want to be any more different. I was having trouble fitting in even to my Sunday church I attended. I thought, boy. And you know what? I went to all these pastors, and I pled with them. I said, give me some biblical evidence. I've accepted the Lord because I believe the Bible. I need to go by the Bible. Because when I was trying to find out what church to go to, they all disagreed with each other. So I thought, I'm going to go by the Bible. And every pastor gave me a different answer. And they all contradicted each other. One said, yes, the Sabbath is still there. Sunday is the real seventh day. Its calendar's been changed. And another one said, we're not under the law. We don't need to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. I said, what, we can break the Ten Commandments? No, well, we keep the spirit of the law. I said, what does that mean? And they had no problem with keeping the law literally until you mentioned the Sabbath. Then it says spiritually. Then, of course, you have the ones who said that, you know, Jesus rose on the first day and that made it the new Sabbath day. And I said, is there a commandment where he commands us to keep the first day? No. You'd think, friends, that after all this time through this seminar that somebody who would send in one question, one comment that would give us 
a scripture where the Lord commands us to remember the first day as the new Sabbath for the Christians. It's not there. God would not be so ambiguous regarding one of his commandments. How more direct, how more prominent can God be than he was? Spoke it with his own lips, wrote it with his own finger, in stone to represent the unchanging eternal nature of it. And then he said, heaven and earth will not pass away before one dot or one tittle passes from my law. Tell me, how could Jesus have made it more clear that the Ten Commandments have not changed and that would include the Sabbath truth? I'm not saying we're saved by keeping the Sabbath. I still get a chuckle when people come to me and they say, Doug, you're preaching the Sabbath and you're telling people they're saved by works. I say, if you're telling them not to keep the Sabbath, you're the one who is into works. I'm telling them rest, right? Amen. I'm saying keep the Sabbath, rest, Amen. not work. I'm into rest, amen? amen? And then, of course, we've got the very pious people who say, well, you know, Doug, you go ahead and you keep the Sabbath day, but I worship God seven days a week. And I say, well, I believe we should worship God seven days a week, but the commandment says, thou shalt not do any labor. And if you do that seven days a week, you're not holy, you're lazy, right? <laughs> Talks about physical rest. Number 14, what specific sin does God command his leaders to denounce? Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. And this is what I'm trying to do, friends. Pray for me. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. And then he goes on and listen to what he says. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, he specifies what transgression, what trumpet we're supposed to blow from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. You know why he says turn away your foot? Because people are trampling on the law of God. He's saying don't stomp on my law. Don't wipe your feet on it anymore. It's holy. There's only a few things in the Bible that God calls holy. And they're all under attack. Marriage is one of them that God has under attack. The devil's attacking everything holy that God has. On my holy day, my holy day, that's the Lord's day. And call the Sabbath the delight, the holy of the Lord, and honorable. Then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord. Does it sound like a burden or a blessing to you? Blessing. It's a day that he's blessed, and he wants you to experience that blessing, friends. And finally, number 15, when you decide, oh, I didn't, oh, yeah, let me talk about that. Keep in mind, after, after God's people received the seal, these angels, we started our lesson. They're holding back the winds of strife, the great tribulation, until what happens? The servants of God receive the seal of God, the Sabbath of God, in their hearts, in their heads, in their minds. And after that happens, the angels loosen their grip, and the seven last plagues are poured out on the world. Can you see why this is an important prophetic issue, friends? For us in the last days to return to the faith of the apostles, when Jesus ascended to heaven, the 12 apostles in the early church kept all 10 commandments. Jesus is coming back for a church that keeps all 10 again. We need to believe that because soon the angels are going to loosen their grip, the plagues are going to fall. We want to be in the hollow of his hand when that happens. And he's knocking on the door of your hearts now. Those of you who are listening right now, he's inviting you to be not only a hearer, but a doer of the word. Number 15, what will, when you decide to accept Jesus and fully follow him, what happens then? Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. How many of you would like to enjoy that rest? I'd like to invite John to come and to sing. Please do not leave yet. I have something else to share. The Savior is waiting to Oh. 
Tonight, I'd like to ask you to fill out the last question in your lesson. It's an appeal question, your response. Before you can say no to the mark of the beast, you need to say yes to Jesus and the seal of God. Jesus is waiting at the door of your heart for an answer, friends. Will you decide now to move under his glorious Sabbath banner as evidence that you've accepted him as your creator and savior, friends? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's shown you how much he's loved you. He gave his life that you might live forever. Why would you tell him no? Open the door, friends. I'll have John sing the second verse of this song as you pray about your decision. Then we'll close with prayer. If you'll take one step towards the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart, he'll abide. Now I believe there may be some here today who are willing to say, I want that rest that Jesus offers. I'd like to ask here in Manhattan and those of you who are watching wherever you might be around the planet, if right now you would like to come to Jesus and say, yes, I want that rest. I want to lay my burdens down at the cross. I want the Sabbath rest and that peace and that blessing that God has placed in that dimension of that day. If that's your desire, friends, would you stand in his presence right now? Stand where you are. I want to have special prayer for you. Do it because you mean it. You at home, some of you are watching on cable or in your homes. You can stand. God sees you where you are and give him your heart right now. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the power of your word and the clarity of the truth that's telling us that we can come just like we are. And you say, if we come, you will give us rest. Lord, the Sabbath is a memorial of the rest that comes from accepting Jesus, from laying our sins down at the foot of the cross. We're choosing to do that now. Help us to be sealed with your spirit, to be filled with your spirit that we might stand when Christ comes. Bless all of these people, Lord, and be with those who are struggling with this decision. We ask in Christ's name, amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you next meeting.